1. Melee of the Macaques. Ishikaraman Krishna didn't realize she'd spend a lot of time watching Nicobar long-tailed macaques as they slept. Worse, they occupied all the cool shady spots, leaving her exposed to roast in the sun or get drenched in the rain. She fought to stay awake in the sultry heat of the day in Great Nicobar Island while noting what each troop member did every five minutes. Raman Krishna discovered the macaques followed a feeding etiquette. While one ate a ripe pandanus fruit, the others waited in line for their turns. A single monkey couldn't finish the pineapple-like fruit by itself. After it had eaten its fill and moved on, the next one took its place. But on occasion, the monkeys weren't always so polite and could become violent. A skirmish broke out between two big males who shrieked and scratched each other. Other adults joined the melee. Raman Krishna stood still. Three females with infants walked purposefully towards the researcher, raising their eyebrows repeatedly and grunting. Having seen them threaten other members of their troop in this manner, she heeded their warning and backed away. Concerned for their babies, they were minimizing any complications that could aggravate the fight. Most of the time, however, the monkeys didn't react to this human who behaved like none of the others they had encountered. Before studying them, Raman Krishna spent 45 days getting them used to her. She followed them through the rainforest and mangroves, in the blazing heat and soaking rain. Only when they ignored her could she begin her study. Sometimes, she couldn't help drawing their attention. Quietly amused. On a rainy day, they walked in single file along a fallen log to cross a marsh. She too stepped on the trunk only to have it crumble under her weight. She plunged into the sticky mud with thousands of spines from the surrounding cane brake embedded in her clothes and skin. Although the muck held her fast, she managed to scramble onto solid ground. All the monkeys were quietly watching me, transfixed and, I'm assuming, very amused, recalls Raman Krishna. The Nicobar long-tailed macaques also frequented coconut groves, pandanus gardens, and arica nut plantations where they feasted on palm nuts and fruits. At first, Raman Krishna thought the indigenous Nicobarese people would be annoyed with the monkeys having a field day. But they were more than happy to share. Even though both people and monkeys ate pandanus fruit, the communities felt their produce belonged to the monkeys as well. Settlers from mainland India cursed the primates for being pests and threw stones to chase them away. But they also kuchi kued over the cute wrinkly-faced macaque babies. Since the monkeys looked like little humans, the residents expected them to behave similarly respect private property and avoid trespassing. Everybody has a monkey story, whether in the cities, villages, or on the ship to the Nikko bars, says Raman Krishna. Fruit for find. A large male took her binoculars one evening when she had been distracted. Sitting a distance away on a large tombstone in a cemetery, he bit the rubber eye cups into pieces. If the desperate researcher were to approach, he might run away or climb up a tree with it. Soon three monkeys formed a line to patiently await their turns. Raman Krishna took her place as the fourth. When the male couldn't peel the binoculars like a coconut, he banged it against a rock, hoping to find something edible inside. The researcher took a sharp breath at every whack, hoping the binoculars would stay in one piece. After the bored monkey abandoned it, the next one tried its hand at breaking the binoculars. By this time, Raman Krishna had an idea. About 500 meters away was one of the troop's favorite wild jack trees. She brought its fruit and bartered it for the binoculars. Except for the bite marks and chewed eye cups, the pair of binoculars was miraculously still in shape. The researcher too had a story. Jonki Lennon is not a conservationist but many creatures share her home for reasons she is yet to discover. 2. Patriarchy and the Pangolin, Review, Ecology Notes from the Field. Commissioned to study the implementation of the National Agroforestry Policy of 2014 in Gujarat the objective of which was to increase forest and tree cover by encouraging farmers to grow specific tree species alongside their crops by providing them subsidies and distributing saplings Uddipadil and her colleagues, Minya Singh, Prafal Joshi, and the driver Chetan Bai, landed up in Anand district in the summer of 2017, for field work. While going about their research, the trio also came up against conservation issues, human-animal conflict, governmental action, and inaction, and, of course, the patriarchal notions that beset the country among other things. All these interactions with farmers, bureaucrats, forest guards, 
men with expansive mustaches and other living species that are never as aggressive or threatening, are recorded in Podol's Patriarchy and the Pangolin. The connection, Podol points out in her preface, is that just as humans are a threat to wildlife and the natural world in general, the patriarchal system is the oppressor when it comes to women. But all this is handled with a light touch. As she puts it in the acknowledgments, the tone of the book is, light-hearted and lightly heated. Different approaches. Even as you chuckle at Minya's adventures, Pruffle's attempts to keep peace, Chetun buys love life, and Poddle's world weariness, you cannot help but take notes. Finding a snake in a water canal leads the researchers to get two sets of focused group discussions, one all male and the other women only. The difference in approach to agroforestry couldn't be more marked. Another time, while recounting a meeting with villagers near the Gur National Park, Podil shows how the atmosphere and therefore the conversations change when figures of authority show up. This universal declaration of the brotherhood of man and lion sounded like a speech to gathered delegates at the United Nations, she writes. But the humor can't hide the fact that it was the cue for us to leave. And then there's the meeting with the woman farmer, Ronnie. When asked what she wanted conveyed to the forest or any other government department, her reply is quite different from what the researchers had heard till then, need Nirmada canals water, affordable electricity, loan waivers, and access to new technology. What Ronnie wanted was both simple and difficult, the biggest help the government can do for us is to not be a problem. Explaining that she speaks only for Kerwood, she outlines what the area has and adds, what we need from the government is to not mess this up for us. Amid all this, the three are busy spotting birds, snakes, squabbling, sightseeing, all of which adds up to an entertaining read. Take time to note the chapter names as well, Poddle's sense of humor is on full display here. But, as Gene Dries points out in his blurb, under the cover of irresistible humor, patriarchy, and the pangolin ambushes the reader with unsettling questions about Indian society and the world of research. In the light of all that is going on, I couldn't help but wonder if Poddle was using humor to stop herself from bursting into tears. 3. Botanists spot new bryophyte species in Kerala. A new species of moss of the genus Bryochromia has been named after the Malabar region of Kerala from where it was spotted. Bryochromia malabarica, discovered in the Malabar Wildlife Sanctuary along the Western Ghats, is special, say the botanists responsible for its discovery. This tiny bryophyte is only the second species to be identified in the genus Bryochromia which has for long thought to be monotypic, that is, represented by just one species. The team of botanists which made the discovery was led by Manju Sinair of the Zamarin's Guruvayurupan College, Kojakod, R. Prakashkumar, Director, Jawaharlal Nehru Tropical Botanic Garden and Research Institute, Thiruvananthapuram, Prajitha B. of the Malabar Botanical Garden and Institute for Plant Sciences, Kojakod, and W.Z. Ma of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, Yunnan, China. Their findings have been published in the latest issue of the journal Acta Botanica Hungarica. For years, the genus Bryochromia was thought to include only one species, Bryochromia vivicolor. Found on rocks and streams, B. vivicolor has been spotted in Congo and Uganda in Africa, North and South Carolina in the United States, China's Yunnan, Nuwara Aliya in Sri Lanka and Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu and Kerala in India. Bryochromia malabarica was found on rocky patches along a stream in the Malabar Wildlife Sanctuary. The plant, which is light green in color, differs from Bryochromia vivicolor in the structure of its leaves. The plant was first collected in 2014 as part of the PhD program of Ms. Prajitha on the taxonomy of bryophytes of the Malabar Wildlife Sanctuary. Bryophytes are a group of plants that play significant roles in the ecosystem. They arrange the suitable microclimate in the forest ecosystem, and provide suitable microhabitats for many other organisms, especially small insects, Dr. Prakash Kumar said. Bryochromia malabarica is the twelfth species of bryophytes newly described from Kerala in recent years, said Dr. Manju, who has been studying this unique plant group for the past two decades. The present discovery indicates the potential of our habitats in holding new taxa, and the need for detailed documentation, she said. Dr. Ma of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, one of the co-authors of the paper, helped in confirming the plant as a distinct species, Dr. Manju said. 4. TUDA plans, mini forest, near Tyropati. If competition leads to excellence in humans, why not in trees? 
it is with this idea that the Tyropati Urban Development Authority, TUDA, has proposed to develop a park with high-density plantation, with the larger aim of environment management and carbon dioxide mitigation. The idea is simply based on the survival of the fittest concept. Random saplings are planted in close proximity, that is, at a distance of half a meter, so that the truly deserving ones not only survive but also emerge stronger. The concept was introduced in Japan in the 80s by Akira Miyawaki, a renowned botanist and expert in plant ecology, as a new and innovative reforestation approach. The specialist in seeds used native plant varieties and recommended an unusually dense plantation to trigger competition. The technique has worked worldwide, irrespective of soil or agroclimatic conditions. TUDA has taken up the task of developing a park, touted as a mini forest, in Avalala Panchayat abutting Tyropati where a total of 4,200 plants, comprising 130 species, will be grown in a small area of 1.3 acres. A similar attempt was made by the forest department in Vijayawada, Shrikalhusti, and near Naravarapal in the past, but this is the first time that an urban development authority has taken up the challenging task. Native plants, we are growing native plants such as Merdu, Bandaru, Pedamanu, Udaga, Chigara, Panasa, Adavinima, Kanchanam, Pasupavajaru, Bandiga Giravinda, Veliga, and Bamalameri in this park, says TUDA Chairman Shavir D. Bhaskar Reddy. Such trees with wider canopy will ensure development of an entire ecosystem, including microbes, worms, and insects, reptiles and birds. Miyawaki Park's going by its success, more such, Miyawaki Parks will be developed across TUDA limits, adds Vice Chairman S. Hari Krishn hinting at plans to create such urban forests in Tyrachanar and Shrikalhusti. TUDA invested a mere 10 Indian rupees lock towards Borewell and Drip Irrigation Network, as the saplings were supplied free of cost by Andhra Pradesh Greening and Beautification Corporation. The existing soil was replaced with fertile topsoil, cocoa peat, vermicompost, or cow dung, and rice husk in equal proportion. 5. Ghost Forests, an Indicator of Climate Change Scientists at the Duke University and the University of Virginia have recently documented how sea level rise is triggering forest die-offs in coastal regions. Studying the vegetation in North Carolina, they find that rising seas are inundating the state's coast, and salt water is seeping further into the land and wetlands. This salt is killing huge swaths of contiguous forest, which the scientific community calls ghost forests. Using satellite images, they have shown that more than 10% of forested wetland within the Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge in North Carolina have been lost over the last 35 years. They point out that the widespread loss of forest has cascading impact on wildlife. Ghosts forests have been witnessed in other parts of the world too. What is sea level rise and how does it give rise to ghost forests? Let's find out. What is sea level rise? Sea level rise is an increase in the level of the world's oceans due to the effects of global warming. The rise in sea levels is linked to two primary factors. Thermal expansion. The oceans are absorbing more than 90% of the increased atmospheric heat associated with greenhouse gas emissions. When water heats up, it expands. The ocean water expands and takes up more space. This is called thermal expansion, and it is responsible for one-third of the sea level rise. Impact of sea level rise The impact of sea level rise includes flooding, habitat destruction, soil erosion, and disappearance of low-lying islands. Rising sea levels also make storm surges capable of much greater damage. Storm surge is the abnormal rise in seawater level during a storm. Storm surge can penetrate well inland. Higher sea levels are coinciding with more hurricanes, contributing to more powerful storm surges that can strip away everything in their path. Many birds use coastal ecosystems to find food, live, and breed. Sea turtles lay their eggs on beaches, returning to the same location every year. When beaches erode, these animals and birds will be affected. Rising sea levels will lead to the displacement of people. It could create 187 million climate refugees by 2100, according to a study. Melting of glaciers and ice caps. Warmer temperatures cause land-based ice such as glaciers and ice sheets to melt, and the meltwater flows into the ocean to increase sea level. Melting ice causes about two-thirds of the rise in sea level. In 2019, a study projected that in low-emission scenario, 
sea level will rise 30 cm by 2050 and 69 cm by 2100. In high emission scenario, it will be 34 cm by 2050 and 111 cm by 2100. About ghost forests. Rising seas often conjure the threat to far away, low-lying nations, coastal cities or island states sometime in the future. But the fact is the effects are already being felt by coastal vegetation. Ghost forests, which are landscapes filled with ghostly dead trees, are the immediate consequences of sea level rise. These leafless, limbless trees can last decades in this dried up barren state. Sea level rise connection. Sea level rise increases the risk of saltwater intrusion. It is the flow of seawater into wetlands and rivers. As sea level rises, more and more salt water encroaches on the land and overtakes fresh water that trees rely upon for sustenance. The salty water slowly poisons trees and eventually kills them. Dead trees with pale trunks are a telltale sign of high salt levels in the soil. The rising salt water also leaves soil unhealthy and forests unsuitable for new growth. What scientists witness is that, while large patches of trees are dying simultaneously, saplings of the same species aren't growing to take their place. Instead, shrubs and grasses that are more salt tolerant are moving in to take their place. Scientists also note that extreme weather events, fueled by climate change, are causing further damage to vegetation in the form of heavy storms, more frequent hurricanes and drought. This is causing mass tree die-offs across coastal regions. 6. This woman-run startup uses crop residue to create bio-batteries. An old biochemistry book from their grandfather's library was the inspiration for Otis Aborn sisters Nikita and Nishita Bailiersing to create an electric vehicle, EV, battery from crop residue. It is still so clear in my mind. There was a statement that read, proteins may have potential benefits in electrolytes. That was the turning point. We pushed ourselves into continuous research and development and founded Nexus Power in April 2019, recalls Nikita. Rewind to 2016, the EV sector was in its infancy with great potential but skewed demand. Buyers were not convinced of the efficacy of an EV battery over a traditional one. This gap in the demand and supply forced us to investigate the root cause for the scepticism. Some of the main concerns were long charging time, high prices, and a paucity of local sources to procure lithium, and of course, the toxicity. According to a report by the Council on Energy, Environment, and Water, CEEW, in November 2020, a total of 5,30,560 EVs, two-wheelers, three-wheelers, cars, and buses, were sold in India. The Bailier Singh sisters aim to take EVs across vehicle segments. The current market caters mainly to low-speed electric two-wheelers that use lithium. Nikita elaborates, we spent almost six months only on theoretical research on bio-organic batteries. Our first prototype was built at home during the lockdown with simple household objects. The biodegradable batteries are fashioned from crop residue. A cell consists of three structural elements, the cathode, anode and electrolyte. Our process of manufacturing plays with the chemistry of the cell and builds all these elements with nanodot proteins derived from crop residue. Our batteries are lithium ion free. We procure the crop remains from local farmers, and by applying a unique extraction and filtration process, we manufacture rechargeable energy storing EV cells out of it, explains Nikita. The materials used at Nexus are derived from natural compounds, which are either underutilized or wasted by other industries. Procurement of crop waste helps the farmers in earning an additional income of 25,000 Indian rupees for every 100 batteries. The manufacturing process has been designed to ensure no element of the environment is exploited. We emphasize having a sustainable manufacturing process with a zero waste model. The production of our batteries creates biofertilizer as byproducts, which we intend to return to the market to facilitate a favorable agricultural yield. That way we ensure a circular and viable green model, Nikita adds. Looking to investors while Nexus is built on sharp technology and lofty targets, the company is mostly bootstrapped. The fledgling company has received two fellowship grants of about 10 Indian rupees lock from the Indian government under its Tide and the Prayas program and through KIITTBI, Kalinga Institute of Industrial Technology Technology Business Incubator, Bhubaneshwar. While the EV sector is ripe for investment, most investors look to the lithium battery market. Nikita is confident, however, 
that Indian consumers are ready for a truly green battery. The major differentiator for Nexus is that ours is a truly, made in India, fast charging battery, which aims to make electric mobility more affordable and efficient. The batteries charge 8 to 10 times faster than conventional ones and last 20% to 30% longer. Most importantly, once the batteries die, they can be recycled at no extra cost, which is not the case with the regular EV offerings. Made out of biodegradable material, the cells rule out toxicity hazards and using crop residue ensures that some of it is not burnt, which in turn protects from deteriorating of air quality. Our entire process is energy efficient and sustainable, says Nishita. The siblings have their eye on the new entrance in EV market. Given a chance, Nexus would love to collaborate with big offerings such as Tesla and Indian vehicle makers like Tata, Mahindra, Hero, and others. We are hopeful of collaborations with multiple two-wheeler EV manufacturers across the Asian region for our pilot program, scheduled for Q3 or Q4 of 2021. A slightly long-term plan would be to develop Nexus batteries for four-wheelers and commercial e-vehicles. We also want to cater to the mobile phone and consumer electronics industry in the future, concludes Nikita. 7. New species of shrew discovered in Andaman's Narkondam Island. Scientists from the Zoological Survey of India, ZSI, have discovered a new species of insectivorous mammal, a white-toothed shrew, from Narkondam Island of the Andaman and Nicobar group of islands. The species Crocigera narcondomica is a new addition to the list of mammals found in the country. Shrews are small and mouse-like mammals, and they live in sub-leaf stratum in the forests. Insects are the primary diet of these animals. This is the first discovery of a shrew from this volcanic island, Narcondum Island, and it increases the number of white-toothed shrew, genus Crocigera, species in India from 11 to 12, said Chandrakasan Sivapiraman, scientist and officer in charge, at ZSI, Andaman and Nicobar Regional Center. The new species is of medium size, head and body lengths, and has a distinct external morphology with darker grey dense fur with a thick, darker tail compared to other species of the genus, Dr. Sivapiruman added. He also said craniodental characters of the species such as brain case was rounded and elevated with weak lambdoidal ridges makes the species distinct in comparison to other close congeners. The details of the discovery have been published in journal Scientific Reports, a publication by the Nature Group in an article titled, Discovery of New Mammal Species, Sericity, Yolapatifla, from Narkondam Volcanic Island, India. With this discovery the number of mammals found in the country have increased from 429 to 430. This discovery is based on both osteological and DNA molecular studies of the specimen, Kailash Chandra, former director and one of the authors of the publication, told the Hindu. The other authors behind the publication who contributed to the discovery are Mano Karan Kumalakunnan, from osteology section of the ZSI, Chinnadurai Venkatraman, scientist from the mammal and osteology section of the ZSI, Shantanukunda Center for DNA Taxonomy, the ZSI, and Gokula Krishnan, research associate at the ZSI. The Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change also took note of the important taxonomical finding through a series of tweets. The new white-toothed shrew species is named after the type locality, Narkondam Island regarded as a volcanic island situated in the Andaman and Nicobar Archipelago, India, Narkondam Shrew Crocigera Narkondamica, the ministry tweeted from its official handle. The discovery of a new insectivorous mammal comes after 43 years. Prior to this, Scientists from the ZSI had discovered Crocigera jenkinsi on the South Andaman Island in 1978. The discovery comes from one of most remote and uninhabited islands, Narkondam Island, of the Andaman and Nicobar Archipelago. Narkondam Island is located about 130 km east of North Andaman, and about 446 km of the west coast of Myanmar. The isolated island covers an area of 6.8 square kilometers and the highest peak, volcanic cone, is 710 m above sea level, however, the base lies approximately 1,500 m beneath the sea. This thickly vegetated island is bordered by cliffs on the southern side and crested by three peaks as part of a volcanic arc that continues northward from Sumatra to Myanmar. 8. Why vultures are important to protect nature. Did you know our feathery friends could be our allies in mitigating the spread of disease that can otherwise infect other animals, including livestock, and humans? An Instagram post by Arulagam Foundation, at Arulagam, 
an NGO that works with vulture conservation in the Nilgiris biosphere has come up with a short video that explains why vultures are protectors of nature. Human race has encountered many viruses like COVID-19, says S. Barthidasan, founder of Arulagam, adding, as shown in the video, our rich biodiversity plays a huge role in keeping the germs at check. Of the many organisms, vultures, as carcass feeders, play a significant role. Though there is no direct relationship between vultures and COVID-19, it's high time we realized their importance and protected them. The scavenger birds hold the key for a natural mechanism of infection control. Often reviled for their appearance and feeding behavior, vultures are the scavengers who do the work of cleaning up and keeping the ecosystem healthy. The beauty is, despite feeding on infected carcass, vultures do not get infected. The acids in their stomach are potent enough to kill the pathogen. Thus, the chain of infection is broken. It invisibly controls the spread of harmful pathogens causing deadly anthrax, cholera, foot and mouth disease, rabies and distemper, Barthidasan says. The birds also prevent the contamination of water sources, especially in the wild. When animals die near watering hole, there is an imminent danger of contamination resulting in a quick spread of infections and mass death. But vultures devour the carcasses in totality thereby preventing a tragic mishap. Despite this, their importance in the ecosystem is not understood, he remarks. In India, we have nine species of vultures, says H. Bijot, who writes about why these birds are indispensable to the biodiversity in his book Valley of Hope Moyar and Vultures, Don Books. A photographer, independent researcher, and conservationist, he adds that in Tamil Nadu, one can spot the long-billed vulture, Indian vulture, red-headed vulture, white-rumped vulture, and the Egyptian vulture at Moyar Gorge in the Nilgiris biosphere of the Western Ghats. In the last four years, the population has grown by maybe 10%. One has to learn about nature and the purpose of scavenging to understand why vultures matter. Restoring the population is an uphill task as vultures are slow breeders, says Barthidasan. If they become extinct, there will be a huge ripple effect. Other scavengers like rats and dogs may take over, temporarily, but with that comes problems like increased incidence of rabies. According to scientific studies, a veterinary, non-steroidal, Anti-inflammatory drug called diclofenac administered to cattle had led to a catastrophic decline of vulture species in the South Asian region. Though diclofenac is now banned, other equally harmful drugs are still in use, he adds. Barthidasan, however, is hopeful that vultures will be back in large numbers and circling the blue skies. 9. Germany could lose last glaciers in 10 years. Germany's glaciers are melting at a faster pace than feared and the country could lose its last ice caps in 10 years, an alarming report said Thursday. The days of glaciers in Bavaria are numbered. And even sooner than expected, said Torsten Glauber, environment minister of the southern region, home to Germany's ice-capped Alps. The last Bavarian alpine glacier could be gone in 10 years. Scientists had previously estimated the glaciers would be around until the middle of the century but the melting has accelerated dramatically over the last years. Located in the Zugspitze area and in the Berchtesgaden Alps, Germany's five glaciers have lost about two-thirds of their volume in the past decade. Their surface areas have also shrunk by a third equivalent to around 36 football fields. Issuing a stark warning over global warming, Glauber stressed that the glaciers are not only a monument of Earth's history in the form of snow and ice. They are thermometers for the state of our climate, he added. A global study released Wednesday found nearly all the world's glaciers are losing mass at an ever-increasing pace, contributing to more than a fifth of global sea level rise this century. An international team of researchers analyzing images taken by a NASA satellite said that between 2000 to 2019, the world's glaciers lost an average of 267 billion tons of ice each year enough to submerge Switzerland under 6 meters of water every year. The report came as meteorologists in Germany said this April has been the coldest in four decades. Like elsewhere in Europe, Germany has recorded wild weather in recent years. After a winter in which temperatures plunged well below freezing in February, the mercury rose to 25.9 degrees on April 1 before slipping more than 15 degrees for much of the rest of the month. Environmentalists blame global warming for the shifts and have been urging governments to do more to halt the damaging trend.
Under the 2015 Paris Agreement countries aim to keep the global temperature increase to under 2 degrees Celsius, and ideally closer to 1.5 degrees, by 2050. Climate activists scored a landmark victory Thursday in a case against Chancellor Angela Merkel's government as the Constitutional Court ruled Berlin's Environment Protection Plan insufficient. 10. It's a goal for Forest Department in Tamil Nadu as it nets wild elephant Rivaldo. Wild elephant Rivaldo, habituated to living close to humans in the buffer zone of the Mudumalai Tiger Reserve, MTR, was on Wednesday trapped inside a crawl, a possible first step towards permanent captivity. The elephant had become used to humans as residents regularly fed it a nutritious diet of fruits and sugarcane. It stopped venturing into the forest in search of food over the last few months, preferring instead to roam around the region surrounding Vazathotam village. Forest department officials say the animal was also suffering from health problems, and they had built a crawl, an elephant shelter to restrict its movement, using which it can be trained through a system of rewards and punishments, at Vazathotam. The animal was lured with food and led into the crawl, which was promptly shut. In a statement, Deputy Director of MTRLCS, Shrikanth said in a first of its kind, an attempt was made to capture and tame a wild elephant without tranquilizing it. Rivaldo has trouble breathing and we cannot tranquilize the animal, as it could potentially lead to complications, said Mr. Shrikanth, who added that the pachyderm will be kept inside the crawl and treated for injuries. A few weeks ago, the Madras High Court had passed an order that the elephant should be released into the wild after it was treated for injuries. As per the directions of the Honorable High Court, all attempts and actions will be taken to treat Rivaldo, after a period of observation and attempted treatment, a decision will be taken in consultation with a team of veterinarians on whether the elephant can be released again into the wild, Mr. Shrikanth said. The Forest Department made efforts earlier to guide Rivaldo to the Thepe Kaju elephant camp, but the elephant escaped. 11. The business of gardening continues to bloom across India amid the pandemic. Over the last couple of weeks people have been speculating about an impending lockdown. And that has brought even more plant enthusiasts here, says K. Subramaniam, the owner of K.S. Garden in Pena Ayur. They want to stock up on a variety of flowers and foliage to cheer them up as they stay indoors. In addition, this rising bevy of first-time gardeners are also buying compost, cocoa peat, and pots so they can nurture plants and see something positive take shape in a world that is unnervingly unpredictable right now. With this sudden influx of clients, Subramaniam says he had to round up his troops to manage the crowd on weekends. Normally I have three to four sales assistants but on weekends I need at least ten of them, he says. With the fresh lockdown restrictions starting today, he is now allowed only 50% of his staff and the nursery is permitted to be open till noon. While he expects the shorter working hours to impact business, he adds that on the whole he has seen a rise in clients over the past year. Before COVID-19, he says he would get an average of 7 clients a day. This rose to 20 visitors per day on weekdays, and 50 on each day of the weekend till last month. Many were young first-time plant buyers, who replaced their mall visit with the relative safety of the wide, open spaces the nurseries offer. Before the second wave, he was also getting road trippers on driving vacations from other cities. It is easy for my clients to maintain physical distancing in a large, open area such as my nursery. They have enough space to spread out and admire the variety on display, Subramaniam says, adding that he gets his staff tested as an additional safety measure. The 10,000 square feet green space houses nearly one lock variety of plants including grass, home garden, vegetables, potted plants that Subramaniam procures from Pune, Rajmundri, Bengaluru, Kudlar, Puducherry, and Thiruvananthapuram. He gets stock once a week and says that incoming stock for succulents, tabletop and hanging varieties has gone up by 50%-60% given the demand. I think with clients not having to go to office they are using that time to nurture plants, he smiles. I am hoping that the interest doesn't fade in the future, he adds. For a less empty home a number of nurseries and horticultural farms mushroomed along the ECR over the last few years. But with many more people taking to gardening to counter the tense monotony of lockdowns, smaller ones have been launching despite the economic slowdown. While the pandemic shut several small enterprises and made a dent on the balance sheets of the big ones, it kept many plant nurseries not just open, but thriving. 
Vizakapat Nam-based CMR Nursery Garden was bracing for the Great Recession all over again when its seasonal business saw a steep decline in March-May last year. However, that did not last long. By June, our business roared back with a 40% increase in sales as compared to pre-COVID-19 times, says Mavuri Venkat Ramana, founder and managing director of CMR Group. The nursery that has around 800 varieties of plants along 16 acres received on an average 200 daily footfalls till last month. Now with the state going under restrictions again, and shortened opening hours, 6 a.m. to noon, a low lies ahead. However, judging by the rush of Instagram and Facebook advertisements for online plant nurseries, buyers are as enthusiastic about shopping online. Ahmadabad-based MyBajicha saw their sales grow during the July to September period a time when most people were working from home. Samitra Kabra, co-founder of MyBajicha, says has been receiving a lot of orders from Tier 2 cities lately, this was not the case earlier. New plant products buoyed by Urban India's renewed interest in gardening, MyBajicha is now focusing on developing new products such as pressed flower diaries and moss frames. A welcome addition, as, for many, Nature has become an extension of home decor. Perhaps, another reason for the popularity of plants. With a lot of people still working from home, a plant on their desk or living room will help them feel fresh. This is how they can reconnect with nature, says Samitra. Pune-based nursery Live 2 saw their sales double in the last year, with their vegetable seeds pack especially in huge demand. We're seeing a definite spike in seeds that's continuing to rise this year, says Sutander Kumar co-founder of Nursery Live. The bulk of the sales came from the June-October period when business sprung back with 70,000 orders in a month. Now it has stabilized to 50,000 orders in a month, which is still higher than the 35,000 we did pre-COVID, adds Suttender. With the supply chain network still affected in many parts of the country due to the pandemic, Nursery Live plans to join hands with more local partners in cities across India to bridge the gap between plant growers and buyers. With nurseries observing a surge in first-time gardeners primarily young working professionals and families with young kids they are helping clients with personalized guidance, online or over the phone. We launched a work-from-home plant pack which has a mix of five species that are low-maintenance and perfect for low-light conditions. These include Syngonium variegated, Erica palm and Peace lily, says Suttender. No wonder, most new buyers ask for them, concurs Samitra who likes to refer to these varieties as indoor beginner plants as they require minimum effort and attention. He also adds Sansevieria, Pothose, Alaonema, and Hoyas to list of the it plants. Ferdi Pake, a resident of Egmar, her joy every morning is to look at the plants on her balcony, along with her grandchildren. She started out with easy-to-handle plants and on the behest of the grandkids is now mulling over procuring a few ornamental varieties. The kids and I feel a sense of achievement every morning when we see flowers blooming or new leaves opening up. There is this joy because we have created this, it's alive, growing, blooming and brightening up our space. It is a positive, productive, distressing hobby, she says, adding that, sometimes even if we do not get to see people, seeing these flowers can make our surrounding feel less empty. 12. How donkeys digging wells help life thrive in the desert. For thousands of years, horses and donkeys have been some of our species' most important partners. A new study published Thursday shows they're also friends to desert animals and plants, by digging deep wells that provide a vital source of water, especially at the height of summer. Biologist Eric Lundgren, lead author of the paper in Science, told AFP he first began noticing the phenomenon while working in western Arizona as a field technician studying river systems. People just didn't think it was worthy of scientific attention, said the scientist, who is now at the University of Technology Sydney. Lundgren had read about African elephants digging wells that were the only source of water for other animals during the dry season, and wanted to know if horses and donkeys might play a similar role in America. The idea was intriguing, especially since donkeys and horses are considered agents of biodiversity harm as they are not native species in the region, he said. Over the course of three summers, he and his team surveyed sites in the Sonoran Desert that stretches across Arizona and California. They documented the relative contribution of wells dug by horses and donkeys compared to the surface water that was available to animals from desert streams, some of which are intermittent while others are permanent. The team also set up camera traps to learn how other animals were utilizing the wells. 
Invasion biology? They found that wells dug by the equids to depths of up to 6 feet, 2 meters, increased water availability for many native desert species, and decreased the distances between important water sources during dry periods. The wells were especially important during the hottest and driest parts of summer, when they provided the only available water source at some sites. Lundgren said the horses and donkeys acted as buffers against the extreme variability of desert streams from year to year. The donkey wells kept water in the system. And these features were used by pretty much every species you could picture, including some surprising ones like black bears, that we didn't expect to see in the desert, he said. Other species that flocked to the wells and were caught on camera included mule deer, bobcats, woodhouses scrub jay and javelinas. The team even spotted some river tree species sprouting from abandoned wells, indicating they also serve a role as plant nurseries. Horses and donkeys were introduced to the Americas by Europeans to assist with the colonization of the continent, but their use declined with the advent of the internal combustion engine. Since then, they have been studied as invasion biology, said Lundgren, which does not consider them to be a part of the local wildlife. But this thinking is too tunnel visioned and has prevented scientists from having a more nuanced understanding of their effects on their ecosystems, he argued. Lundgren and his colleagues said in their paper that the wells will be increasingly important as human activity and climate change reduces the number of perennial streams in these regions. Another element to the story is that the behavior of modern horses and donkeys might have an ancient precedent, said Lundgren. Horses, elephants, and other large animals that roamed North America until a mysterious extinction event around 12,000 years ago could have once fulfilled a similar role.